If you guys are in the market for a cheap CPU that has eight cores and 16 threads, well, you're probably gonna be looking at Ryzen 7 1700s that are coming up on the used market. But if you're like me and in your area, you can't really find any good deals on first gen used Ryzen stuff at the moment, is something like an E5 2689 from AliExpress, which currently can be had for $53 shipped a good buy. Well, in today's video, we're gonna check out this CPU, which in the past, if you guys have seen me put together some Xeon builds, you'll know that I put together something very similar with an E5 2670. And I put two of those CPUs on an ASRock motherboard and actually made that my main rig. And now the difference between the 2670 and the 2689 that we're using in today's video is that the 2670 will go to three gigahertz all core turbo as opposed to the 2689, which will go to 3.3 gigahertz all turbo. Now, how I found out about this CPU was I watched a video from Phil's Computer Labs and he tested it against a Ryzen 7 1700 and found that the older Xeon could still get up and boogie. But in today's video, I'm gonna be disabling all the Spectre and Meltdown updates and also pairing it with the Radeon 5700 XT to see how it stacks up with this GPU. Though one major complaint with getting a CPU like the E5 2689 is the motherboards. Something like this, a Gigabyte X79 UD3, which was an overclockable board, it had good components on board, especially the VRM, is something of a rarity nowadays, where if you're looking for something like this, you're gonna be paying more than it's really worth, especially when you compare it to something like a B450 and you chuck a Ryzen 6 core in it. But besides that, we have this right here. This is a board that I picked up for 80 US dollars. It's called the Machinist. And I just looked through a heap of different motherboards because I wanted to try something new. And this one looked like it's bringing decent value for money. We've got two native PCI Express 16X slots, two 1X slots, M.2 support, four fan headers, one of those being a PWM, six SATA ports that are actually quite well placed on the board in relation to where you're going to fit your graphics card and USB 3 at the back and a USB front out connector on board, as well as hoping to have quad channel memory, though we will check that out later. But with that aside, if you are getting this CPU or motherboard combo, you'll have to pick out a cooler that fits X79 sockets. That's the ones with the screws in them. Something like the Snowman, I believe, won't fit on this motherboard. And I love the snowman. And with that aside, let the testing begin. And this is the box that it comes in. Really no frills, but actually quite well packaged in terms of bubble wrap. And you get a basic IO shield included. So this is our new test bench. Let's get the numbers. And you're also gonna need your own Moss Out of the Sea battery to go in there. About a month ago to this date, I noticed my Xeons had been affected by some slowdown. It was as if someone had gotten a slug and injected it straight into the CPU. If this was an illness comparable to something that would affect a human, one would call it slugitis. And you're probably wondering, how does one even cure slugitis? Well, thanks to a user called DeFreak, I now had a new bag of tricks where I could directly disable all these Spectre and Meltdown and MDS mitigations via RegEdit additions. After this, the sluggishness was lifted and it's like my Xeons now had new life. If one was to go see the original Ghostbusters, what we have right here today is the sequel. Ghostbusters. <laughs> Thank you. 
And now the results are in for the $53.2689 Xeon. And we decided to compare it against the 9900K. And that's clocked to five gigahertz. It's got the latest and greatest. It's got a water cooler. It's got fancy and expensive Corsair Dominator memory. It's got a Z390 Phantom Gaming X, some of the best stuff in the biz for getting those gaming benchmarks. And coupling it with the 5700 XT, we really didn't see that much of a difference at all. And I gotta thank you once again, DeFreak, for those mitigations, disabling Spectre and Meltdown completely, because we saw here, Tom Clancy's The Division 2, 102 FPS average versus 105. 1% and 0.1% lows were a little bit better on the 9900K. Of course, that's to be expected. But then we move over to GTA 5. Same story again, 1080p, mind you. This isn't going to 1440p or 4K. And we saw 91 average FPS versus 89 with 1% uh, and 0.1% lows that were very close. F1 2019, we lost about, wait for it, four FPS on average. Nothing at all to be sweating about, especially since the CPU on the eight cores with the X79 Xeon is costing a 10th of the price of the 9900K. But we're certainly not getting a 10th of the FPS as we're seeing in Strange Brigade, 165 average FPS versus 166. 1% 1 lows, 116 versus 119. 0.1% lows, 112 versus 110. So it even got a little bit of a victory there. But of course, that's all variance. 0.1% lows are very, very shaky when it comes to measuring them consistently. But regardless, one FPS, this was the best case scenario in these titles. Then we move over to control. Again, one average FPS difference, 88 versus 89. But the last game we're gonna pull up here was Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And we did lose 19 FPS in this game. So one game out of six at 1080p, we lost a significant amount of FPS. But still, I ask you to raise the question to yourselves, is 100 FPS a bad thing? And I don't think it is. So this Xeon, the 2689, it's doing a phenomenal job when it's coupled with something that's more relevant for gamers like a 5700 XT, or of course, if you're going something like a 2060, 2060 Super, GTX 1660, RX 580, RX 570, the list goes on. So we're seeing here, past this $400 price point on GPUs, even at 1080p, we're not seeing a big difference between the latest and greatest CPUs versus something like this $53 Xeon from AliExpress. But now we're going to move on to the motherboard because it plays an important role. If you've got a crap motherboard, then you're going to be losing performance and you may risk having something that overheats or breaks down. And this machine is bored. I'm happy to report that I was very impressed with the numbers coming out of it. First of all, we did the stress test on the VRM, 71 degrees on the PCB after 11 minutes on Ida 64 and then 58 degrees on the heatsink. This is in a 24 degrees C ambient environment. So the numbers were looking really good for the VRM. Now, there is a bit of a downside here and that's the BIOS. It is looking dated, but we were still managing to overclock the memory from 1600 megahertz to 1866 megahertz. And that saw us uh, get quad channel memory at 1866 megahertz on budget memory. So going into CPU ID and IDA 64, this was really interesting because it showed that it was a H67 chipset. And usually we want to see in there an X79 chipset, but it was showing quad channel. So the memory's running in quad channel over some kind of weird hack. So it is working and the quad channel memory is doing a good job of giving you much more memory bandwidth over dual channel DDR3. Now, another great thing about this motherboard is it'll support registered DDR3 memory too. So you can save some money going with some DDR3 memory that's registered as opposed to the unbuffered stuff, which generally costs more at current market prices. Now, moving on to the onboard audio, it's got the Realtek 887 on board. Not half bad, especially when I did the numbers, we checked out with the channel balance only having 0.1 decibel of a difference, the frequency response zero to 20 Hertz, minus six dB, so pretty shaky, but one to 20K, was showing also a little bit wavy. 
and the crosstalk was minus 81 dB. So the numbers were okay for onboard audio. And so if you wanted to go out and get this motherboard and couple it with something like a budget pair of KS75 headphones, which set you back from around 10 to $20, depending where you live, it's gonna be a great budget combo where you got eight cores, 16 threads, a solid motherboard, which when I tested out the USB 3 speeds, they were working absolutely fine. And then we tested out the NIC and that was giving consistent transfers too. So the mic import as well has a little bit of noise. So past the plus 20 dB level, it'll start getting noisy, then plus 30 dB will basically be unbearable. But if you leave this at plus 10 dB 85, it's default setting, it shouldn't be too bad for playing games with your friends. Anyway, the last graph we're pulling up here is the Unigine Heaven results, where this whole combo, and keep in mind we are using DDR3 memory versus the DDR4, and that's only in dual channel on the Z390, we've got 350 watts roughly versus 310 watts on the 9900K setup. So 9900K is a little bit more efficient, but we do have double the memory on this uh, setup, and we do have an older CPU, but it's only burning another 40 watts whilst we're gaming. And so it wasn't such a bad result. And I'm gonna say that you're going to have to be using this system for a very long time at a 40 watt differential to make up that $450 difference on the CPU. And not only that, you've then got the differences on the motherboard and the memory and the cooler needed for the 9900K. So in conclusion, the 2689 Xeon I do have to give another thank you to Phil, also a thank you to DeFreak for telling me to check this one out. Now, I will state that if you're using this as a server or a data center, you may not wish to disable the Spectre and Meltdown updates, but I will put some links in the description below if you want to disable Spectre, Meltdown, and the extra disabling that you can do that I did in this video, then I'll list those reg edit edits as well you can add in via opening up PowerShell as administrator and putting them in. So ultimately, the Xeon still lives strong in 2019, and really the only thing you're going to miss out with this chipset is maybe upgradability, but even then, you can upgrade to a 1680V2 Ivy Bridge 8 core 16 thread or something like that in the future if you've got a bit more money, because we've got USB 3 on the rear and the front out. We've got the M.2 support on this board, as well as having a heap of PCIe lanes and quad channel memory. So this one, especially the board and the CPU coupled together, is a really good combo. And with all that out of the way, we've now got the question of the day, which comes from Jason Fry, and he asks, could I use my GPU flashing tutorial for a couple of MSI RX 570s and flash them back to stock so you can then put them into a gaming PC and flip them. And the question to that is, Jason, you can certainly do that. You've just got to go onto the Tech Power Up website, download the original BIOS, which matches the model number of your RX 570. Because if you try to put another BIOS on there, what it will do is it either just won't work at all or you'll have some problems where you'll still get that exclamation mark in Windows, and so you won't be able to play games on that particular uh, vBIOS. So you can flash it back to normal, but do keep in mind that it has been mined on. So when I do put mining cards in uh, gaming PCs, I do make sure I give them a guarantee, and also I do stress test the mining cards that come through here to make sure that they're not uh, faulty or prone to failing before I do flip them in a gaming PC. Because sometimes, even after you install that stock BIOS, you can then go back into Windows, and once the driver installs, the whole card uh, clonks out. So I've had that happen actually quite a few times here at the studio. So that is something to be careful of. And with all that out of the way, I hope you enjoyed today's video on the 2689 Xeon. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button. Also, I'll leave some links in the description below for the inspector, how to disable that and meltdown, and also the reg edit hacks that you can do to disable it even further, as well as some of the links for the motherboard and the CPU and some RAM 
if you want to get the combo. Anyway, with that aside, peace out for now. Bye.